Uh, do you remember how to do these? No, I think we just have to make it up. Right, okay, I thought it was just me. I, uh, rapid tested, by the way, if you're uncomfortable. You still make me uncomfortable, but that helps, thanks. Let's go! Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> it's a little ridiculous. Good boy. Play all the hits! Left Toronto Maple Leafs. So let me finish. How am I supposed to go to bed after watching that? I'm quite hyped. <laughs> With you wherever you are, welcome to LF. Puppy Ziggy! Oh, all right, let's see if we even remember how to do this. We do! Good job. Oh, but don't pull something, it's been a while. Leafs win! Six to nothing, good gracious, over the Ottawa Senators. Well, in case you forgot, hey, Steve Dangle here. Welcome to my YouTube channel where I do LFR videos reacting to each and every Leafs game after they happen. Could not believe it on the broadcast when they said the Leafs still have over 50 games remaining. At the beginning of the night, the Leafs had almost as many games remaining this season as they had in a full season last year. There's a lot of race left to be ran. Obviously, this was a drubbing. The Leafs just demolished the Ottawa Senators. This game was not even close, not for a minute at any point during this game. So rather than talk about the game, break down piece by piece, I wanna talk about uh, the break that we just had, and I wanna talk about 2021 and what I'm grateful for, because everyone did their little tweet thread and I never did mine. And then I was gonna make a video and I got lazy and I'm like, well, wait a sec, you have an LFR tonight. And I said, I do? And I said, yeah, that's a thing you do. That's like your thing. And I went, yeah, but they haven't played for a while. I, I, there aren't many people to talk to right now. So, what happened? Senators, obviously missing a bunch of guys up front, and no, no roster in the league is whole right now. The Leafs, ironically, uh, their forward group is the healthiest it's been all season long. The only absences you can see on the Leafs are on the back end. Jake Muzzin not quite ready to rejoin the lineup, and Timothy Lilligren still in protocol. But apart from the Leafs getting a bunch of guys back from protocol, Mitch Marner, his first game back in a while, Jason Spezza, his first game back after suspension, and Rasmus Sandin back in the lineup after, um, well, he got injured in the same game that Spezza got suspended in. A lot has happened. A lot. Matt Murray back in the net for the Ottawa Senators, which is a great story and Oh, I was conflicted. I know some of you are thirsty for blood, okay? But as a as a hockey fan and as a fan of people, I wanted to cheer for Matt Murray while also actively cheering against him on account of, you know, he plays for the other team. And the game doesn't start very well for the Ottawa Senators and the night is busy for Matt Murray. The Leafs greatly outshooting the Ottawa Senators. The Sens don't even have a shot on goal for a big chunk of the first period. But Matt Murray up to the task, making a few really good saves. Leafs even strength, they can't get a goal. Leafs on the power play, still can't get a goal. Sends to the power play, this is where they turn the tide of the game. Except no, they very don't. Leafs on the penalty kill, TJ Brody with a magnificent breakup. Actually, they got a great shot of it on the Leafs Twitter page. This dude loves pressing L1 and R1. He has a higher success rate doing that in real life than anyone in EASHL history. It's an automatic penalty basically, along with everything else. And the game doesn't sink for five minutes coming back from commercial break! Anyway, Puck goes back up the ice. It's a two-on-one between uh, David Kampf and Justin Hall. Two-on-ones are always fun because you're like, ooh, who's involved? Short-handed, it's even more fun. One, because it's not supposed to happen, you're short-handed. But two, it's never the names you think. When David Kempf leads your two-on-one in goals, uh, I don't like the odds. To which David Kempf responds, screw you, Steve Dangle, I'm gonna pass it to Justin Hall and he's gonna score! Justin Hall! Finishes the two-on-one, buries it past Matt Murray, and with what what is what is going on? Finally scores his first goal of the season, his first goal in 27 games. He's on hockey night in Canada, and they show him with a giant wad of stuff up both noses. Both noses, Steven. Nostrils. Both nostrils. I'm tired. It's New Year's Day. You leave me alone. By the way, the way Hall's n noses, nostrils got that way is Rasmus Sandin gets caught up behind the Leafs net and accidentally kicks Hall in the face. That could have gone a lot worse than that. Something that couldn't have gone worse, the Senators penalty kill, because 27 seconds later, after Justin Hall gets his first of the season, here comes Ilya Mikheyev! And he's skating towards the net, he's the fastest man alive, and he's skating towards Matt Murray, it's gone! Ilya Mikheyev! This is... His injury in his rookie year was to his wrists, and his injury this year was to his thumb. Mikheyev's best asset has always been his feet, and he hasn't suffered a major injury there, so they're doing just fine. He is honest to goodness 
who's faster in the NHL? How many names? How many, how many names? If there was an endless budget, if some billionaire named me paid everyone in the NHL to show up to the All-Star game and had a skills competition, where does Ilya Mikheyev finish the fastest skater? If I'm not mistaken from the All-Star game in St. Louis, Matt Barzal is actually the NHL's reigning fastest skater. He beat Connor McDavid. But remember, fastest skater involves the, the turn, actually several turns. I don't know how Mikheyev would do with the turn, but if it was just from goal line to goal line, I don't think anybody beats Mikheyev. The list has to be less than 10 players. Heck, with a loose puck, we already know he can keep up with McDavid. This dude is the fastest man alive. And speaking of fastest, this was a record for the fastest. From NHL Public Relations, Justin Hall and Ilya Mikheyev each scored a shorthanded goal 27 seconds apart to give the Maple Leafs a 2-0 lead. The Maple Leafs matched their franchise record for fastest two shorthanded goals, a mark set by Boreas Salming and Greg Terrian on November 16th 1986. Two shorthanded goals on the same penalty kill, only 27 seconds apart. This hasn't happened since Boreas Salming was a Leaf! Dude who is regularly the oldest Leaf in Leafs alumni games. And also the most jacked because he's Swedish. And because I'm a massive nerd Terrian, his first goal of the season during that 27 second record from 1986, Boreas Salming his third of the season. Ah, they were almost the same. Justin Hall and Ilya Mikheyev, both their first goals of the season. How does that happen? And until the Senators got a few shots with about two minutes to go in the period, the Leafs had as many shorthanded goals on one penalty kill as the Senators had shots on goal. The reason I said it wasn't close off the top is it wasn't. Second period, things go from bad to worse for the Ottawa Senators. They take two penalties in the first to the Leafs' one. And in the second period, they take another penalty less than a minute in, and three straight in the second period. Tavares would end up taking one while the Leafs were on the power play, but that means the Sens' power play was very short. The Sens took five of the game's first six penalties. Three of them went to Zach Sanford alone. The Senators did start to get some shots, but they just could not keep it up, always on the penalty kill. It got to the point where they started attacking a lot more on the penalty kill, and that started to help because they had to. But the Leafs still outshoot them 15 to 9 in the second period, and the only goal, because of course, TJ Brody on the backhand wraparound? Yeah, that makes sense. TJ Brody, thus far the game's leading goal scorer with his second of the season, and it's 3 0 Leafs after two. Third period, and this is why I'm speeding through it, this is where the Leafs just killer instinct. Listen, first game back after a long time, I was not expecting good hockey, and frankly, the first 10 minutes of this game, it was garbage. But with sloppy hockey and rusty players, there's the potential for blown leads, and the Leafs very did not blow this lead. William Nylander just flying up the ice, dancing feet, dart of a pass up the ice from Travis Dermott. William Nylander receives it. All the moves in the world on Matt Murray, I felt bad after that one, but Willie Styles has not lost a step for nothing. A minute and one second later, the Leafs on the power play again. What's Ilya Mikheyev doing on the power play? Scoring, apparently, his second of the game, second of the season, 5 nothing, And a nice pass from John Tavares, bullet from William Nylander, his second of the game as well, 15th of the season, that's it. Mikheyev on Hattie Watch, Nylander on Hattie Watch, but as the game kept going and Justin Hall took that late penalty, I thought, okay, don't screw this up for Jack. Because once the Senators finally started putting pucks on net, he low-key had a very good game. That unbelievable toe save he had. But the clock winds down, Soup stops all 23 shots for the shutout and the Leafs win 6-0. So before we get to questions, let's, let's address some stuff that I didn't off the top. Um, there weren't any fans. Well, actually, no, there were a couple fans. If you watch the Watch a Leafs Game with Steve Dangle uh, stream on the Sportsnet YouTube channel, you'll notice I went, is that Dart Guy? Dart Guy was there. He was there with Curtis from Alberta. You've probably seen him on Twitter. He's the Leaf fan from Alberta with the unbelievable Leaf Shrine, every jersey ever. There's two Leafs memorabilia shrines I've ever seen. And basically one and two, like the Crosby and Ovechkin of the two, uh, Leaf fan Mike, who I'm sure you know of, who lives in Toronto with the ridiculous shrine, and Curtis from Alberta. Nothing else I've seen even comes close. So those two were there. I don't know how that happened, but good for them. Other than that, there weren't any fans in the building. 
And I got a lot of complaint tweets about that. And listen, it's weird. It's weird and I don't like it. It's especially weird because there was a game in like minus 20 temperatures in Minnesota where the building was just packed with people. And then there's two guys, as far as I can tell, and Carlton. Carlton the Bear was there as well in Toronto. The Leafs not having fans in the stands and the reduced capacities throughout Canada. I think that's only going to be a temporary thing. I certainly hope it's going to be a temporary thing. I hope COVID's a temporary thing. I'm not going to get that worked up about it because, dude, I, they're playing the games. They're playing the games. That It wasn't clear they were going to do that for a while. The NHL's decided come hell or high water, they're going to do these things. If no fans in the building for like, I don't know, a month is what it takes, fine. Questions, and then I want to talk to you about the year that was. Rate Hall's play on a scale of 1 to 10 based on tonight's performance alone. Well, I gotta tell you, he stepped up. I mean, uh, Muzzin Lilligren essentially became the shutdown pair after Hall was kicked off it, and neither of those players was able to play in this game. So it was Hall playing with, who did Hall get to play with? Sandine. I don't know if that's ever really been a pairing. And it was Dermot Biega. Dermot Biega, by the way, no chemistry whatsoever. And they played a pretty good game. But Hall looked poised. And I don't know if there's a player who needed a little bit of time more than Justin Hall. He had the injury during training camp, which is sort of an underrated thing with him and not talked about enough. He's been playing the games, but man, he's been brutal at times. He needed to step up in this one, and he did. I liked him. It's not just the goal, but when Justin Hall is pinching a little bit, when he's cheating a little bit offensively, that's when you know he's feeling it because he likes doing that. If you watch him in the minors, he loves doing that. And I haven't seen him do it this year at all. So it was good to see him get one. It seemed to go to his legs. I was very happy that the Leafs didn't uh, allow a goal when he was in the box at the end of the game. I thought he had a good game. So if I had to rate it out of 10, take off something for the penalty. But oh, his overall play was pretty good. And the goal, I'm going to give him a 7.5. Doesn't it feel great to be back? Yeah. Yeah, it does. Dude, I don't do well without hockey. <laughs> I lose purpose, okay? And when it happens in the middle of the season, when there aren't NHL games in, like, December, I get antsy because... What the heck? So it feels good that it's back. It's a, you know, there's some things about it that are a little different, but I'm glad it's back. And a little bit of positivity here. Thanks to Paul for this one. Way to go, Paul! Leafs win aside, can we take a moment to acknowledge the incredible story out of Vancouver today regarding their assistant equipment manager and the Kraken fan who potentially saved his life. So I'm not going to read that entire thing out loud, but basically what happened is during a Canucks versus Kraken game in Seattle, there was a Seattle Kraken fan sitting behind the Vancouver Canucks bench. They looked at some sort of mole, to my understanding, on the neck of one of the equipment managers and identified it as something that was potentially dangerous. They wrote a message on their phone and showed that to the person on the Canucks, the equipment manager, and they got it checked and it ended up being dangerous. They were right, but because they caught it, they're okay. And it was this big search to find this person today, and then they do find the person, and they embrace, and they hug, and, and the, you know, there's profuse thanks going around. There is so much good and so much positivity in the world you just gotta look for it sometimes bless the vancouver canucks genuinely bless them for putting that out into the world because i think we all needed a little bit of that so let me be a little uh indulgent i want to talk about 2021 i i do want to talk about watch a leafs game with steve dangle real quick if you watch that stream you know it was a bit of a mess uh it was technical difficulties nothing we can do about it. So it was supposed to be my night off. Uh, Nick Kiprios and Justin Bourne were supposed to fill in, and they did for the first period, but it's unfamiliar territory, and you're dealing with technical difficulties. That's a nightmare scenario for them, and I feel awful that they had to deal with it. Then I hopped on board, and everything's fine. Just kidding. I had the exact same technical difficulties, so we had to restart the stream. But once everything was fixed, everything was going, we had a great time. We had a great time. Uh, there were no issues at all. Bless the behind the scenes, uh, the, the production crew. 
<laughs> dealing with that is a nightmare. Bless Born and Kipper for having the patience to try and get through all that crap. I hope they get another opportunity. And, I mean, uh, you for watching and, you know, sticking with us through all that. Next week will be better. And I know that because next week is against the Colorado Avalanche and producer Drew will not let that fail. Unless the Avs are losing, then he might. So, 2021. Wow. What a year. Um, if you watched my stream or whatever, um, you know, like, one of the most important things to me over the past year has been becoming a dad. And I became a dad in 2020, but... It's been different, and if you're a parent, you probably know all the different stages. Uh, he went from cry potato to around this time last year, six months, and now he's a toddler and he's like running around, and I get to interact with him and play with him and teach him stuff. He learns stuff. Like, he pays attention. I gotta be careful and everything. That was the best part of this past year, I'd say. But from a this perspective... You've always been amazingly supportive of this channel. Um, you've always been amazingly supportive of all the stuff I've done on Sportsnet. The hat picks, the dang it's, the streams. I cannot believe the streams. How well they did during the playoffs. How well they did when the Leafs got eliminated. And I was still doing Montreal Canadian streams. And then doing um, the Stanley Cup final stream. And doing regular season streams for the Leafs. You opened a lot of eyes at Big Red Rogers, everyone. Uh, you impressed a lot of people. We've been doing this for a long time. This channel's been going for a decade and a half, and we've been fighting to get everyone's attention, and now we got it. Future is here, the future is us, let's keep that going. And I have to talk about SDPN. What do you even say? I gotta thank Adam and Jesse for... They're amazingly hard work on SDPN and making it into a network at all. Not just, I was about to say the network it is today. The network it is today is still developing, but the fact that it even got off the ground is in large, large, large part because of them and their hard work and pushing me well out of my comfort zone. And part of the reason I let them is the years of trust that we've built up. I could have just been like, oh, been weak need about it, but I let them drag me through this journey. I have to give an enormous thanks to Chris Johnston, the CJ, for really getting everyone's attention and really taking a risk with us and basically being the first guy to join. Julian McKenzie, the man of a thousand jobs, joining him and turning that show into what it is. Andrew Berkshire for being one of the hardest working people in all of hockey with everything he's doing with Game Over. Dude did a stream with COVID. Uh, he's, he's an animal. And the work Adam is doing with Alan Walsh. First of all, thank you, Alan Walsh, for joining SDPN. <laughs> but the guests on Agent Provocateur have been incredible. I was just listening to the Bob McKenzie episode today. I'm only halfway through it, and Bob McKenzie and Alan Walsh are exchanging uh, like stories about times they've been punched. And also a big shout out to Robert Malloy, who does the captions on these videos on this channel, but is also our social manager on SDPN and does amazing things on the SDPN uh, Discord. And while I'm here, shout out to all the mods on the Discord and everyone on the Discord. Everyone who's ever tweeted me, everyone who's ever watched or listened to anything we've done. I believe in this thing. I believe in this thing big time. Expect big things from us in 2022. Oh, and while we're here, uh, outside of SDPN, producer Drew, <laughs> round of applause for producer Drew for editing these videos. Drew, edit yourself a round of applause. Without him, uh, I don't know how on earth um, any of these videos would have happened this season because uh, there's only 24 hours in a day. So, my friend, that is it for this one. Thank you very much for watching. Click like if you liked this video. Click subscribe if you really liked it. Tell all your friends only better things to come.